and he says, you have stage three cancer. Johnny, how did you find carnivore? I found carnivore accidentally on purpose. Um, the date was September 4th of 2023, uh, which would be a Labor Day holiday here in the United States. Um, two weeks prior to that date, I had put myself on a low carbohydrate diet, um, roughly 20 carbs um, a day is what I was uh, re restricting myself to. So when Labor Day holiday came up, I wasn't going to have hot dog buns and hamburger buns and baked beans and mat and baked or potato salad, you know, the usual uh, fixings for this kind of a holiday, kind of a celebration of the end of summer. And uh, so I wanted to supplement and I went rummage through the freezer and I pulled out the hot dogs, the hamburgers, which was a staple for our cookout. And for myself, I pulled out uh, country ribs, which is just uh, a cheap version of, they're just pork ribs, um, some steak, and some chicken breast. And so you can see where this is going. I cooked me up a week's worth of meat on the grill. And um, that evening, everybody was done eating. I felt fantastic. I thought, you know, let's get on YouTube and find some uh, low-carbohydrate recipes. And, and I want to preface this by saying I don't search keto recipes. I don't search uh, Atkins recipes because I have grown to dislike named diets like those in the paleo and the uh, Mediterranean because at some point in my life they have been failures for me. That could be me. That could be the way the diet was designed. But I just got to search in, and of course, you know, when you search low carbohydrate diets, they throw the Atkins and the keto at you. And this one that kept coming into my feed was carnivore diet, carnivore diet. And I'm like, okay, I got to draw the line. Keto and Atkins, they're accepted. Carnivore, that's absolutely crazy. Why would anybody just eat meat? I just ate a whole bunch of meat, you know, but as a staple diet, it's like, no, I'm not going to look at that video either. It's a name diet. I'm just not going to do it. And then this uh, one carnivore video popped up, had Laura Spass picture on it. And it was what I eat in seven days on the carnivore diet. And so I thought, you know, uh, she looks pretty healthy. So I, I, like, I gave in and I clicked on the video and I watched it and I was absolutely amazed at what she was cooking and the way she was fixing it. And I thought, well, I could do that. But the video ended. And when I go back to my feed, all of a sudden my feed is completely full of carnivore stuff. And I can't remember. I can remember sort Laura Spath's video, but I can't seem to remember the video that really sparked my interest. And uh, it was had to do with uh, getting rid of autoimmune diseases or alleviating the uh, symptoms from autoimmune diseases and that one piqued my interest and so i started watching that one and then i just started watching one after the other and i was like i need to be real sleuthy about this and not let my family know what i'm doing because this is the craziest diet i've ever tried in my life and so a week into it uh my wife she just happened to come over and see what I was watching on YouTube. She goes, what are you watching? And I said, would you mind sitting down and watching a video with me? Now, she is a picky eater. So she only eats meat, potatoes, bread, mayonnaise. I mean, it's, it's extremely basic. And she's never eaten a vegetable in her life. And I had her sit down and watch that. And she turned to me and she says, are you kidding me? She says, I've been persecuted my whole life for not eating vegetables. And now you are on a diet that removes all vegetables and all you're eating is meat. And I said, yes. She goes, let's see some more. <laughs> uh, ultimately, she did end up trying the carnivore diet for a while and she lost 10 pounds. And she doesn't need to. She's a very petite woman. She does not need to lose weight, but she did. And um but her cravings were very strong with her. Uh, she still craved the bread. She still craved uh, potato chips or whatever with 
like hamburgers. She just, she says, I can't bring myself to eat a hamburger with a fork. I've got to have it. You know, it's, it's a finger food. I've got to have it between bread. But um, the issues that I have had over the years stem back um, probably 35 years uh, when I was diagnosed with a hiatal hernia. And what led me to, to go and get, I got my hands in the air, what led me to go and, and seek treatment about that is I had a horrible heartburn and they they did the swallow test where you swallow the chalk, the chalky milkshake, and they indicated that I had a hiatal hernia. And later on, uh, the hiatal hernia started turning into bad acid reflux uh, in the evening times, uh, at nighttime. Then uh, one of one other symptom that, that crept into me uh, 24 years ago, and I thought it was because I was stressed of uh, the first company I'd ever worked for had laid us off. And instead of getting um, trip orders for our next, uh, I was a truck driver. So instead of getting orders of where our next destination was, we got an application to the company that had bought us out. Well, they didn't hire us on and I was really stressed and where's the money going to come from. And I got ultimately what ended up being diagnosed as psoriasis. And it was pretty bad. Um, the, um, the psoriasis, I was smoking at the time, and about, let's see, that was uh, 1999, so in uh, 20, 2002, um, I went to a doctor because I was just hyper, hypertensive all the time and just, just didn't feel right, and he says, well, he says, your blood pressure, he says, is borderline, uh, borderline hypertension, he says, We're, we, can, we can treat that, and he says, and do you want to quit smoking, and I'm like, Man, two birds with one stone, sure. So uh, he uh, treated me with uh, Wellbutrin to quit smoking. And the first prescription that I was ever told I was going to be on for the rest of my life was Altenolol, which is just a, a, um, a blood pressure medication, a mild one. And, uh, and he says, now, if you don't want to be on that the rest of your life, he says, you need to change your diet because simply, he says, your blood pressure as low as it is, but yet as hypertensive as it is, can be corrected if you would just bring your weight down. Of course, I didn't do that. You know, I would do anything to lose weight except diet and exercise. And um, so we we carry on to between uh, 2012, 2013. I had my gallbladder taken out. They said it had stopped working. Um, and in 2016, my weight had, let's see, 2013, my weight, I sent you a picture my weight had ballooned up to 335 pounds. So obviously I wasn't doing anything about, about my diet. Uh, I just kept on marching. I had um, the uh, bad uh, acid reflux at nighttime. I was sleeping on the couch with elevated pillows so that I wouldn't, you know, choke in the middle of the night. The acid reflux was bad enough that I would literally have the flu the next day and would have to call into work. It would, it would be, it would be so horrible at nighttime. So I had me like elevated almost like sitting straight up and down. And then uh, a my wife woke me up in 2016 crying her eyes out and she says, you need to go have a sleep study done. She says, I can't get any sleep. You snore so badly. And so I got a sleep study done in 2016 and was diagnosed with sleep apnea, severe sleep apnea. Uh, at the time of the test, they said I was having 120 events in an hour where I would stop breathing and, and, um, and, and start and, you know, with the uh, snoring would, would you know, bring my breathing back, but it was not letting me get into any kind of a sleep mode. And so they gave me, uh, it's a little dream machine. It's a, I guess it's the typical um, machine that they they use for for sleep apnea i don't know it's got a hose and a little nose pillow and the first night that i tried it i dreamed for the first time and i don't i don't remember when i couldn't wait to go to sleep the next night because the dreams were so vivid but the side effect was i had no acid reflux now the machines they they set them at a certain pressure and that's to keep your palate open and 
uh, to allow allow you to be able to breathe. Your palate, you know, sleep apnea is when the palate collapses. You know, and you, that's what that's what vibrates. So it kept my palate open, and the machine was set at twelve psi. So the only thing I can figure is is the pressure down in there kept the acid down in the stomach. And I told my wife, I said, I'm coming off of acid blockers. I, I was taking, um, uh, what is it, Pepsid AC, the over-the-counter stuff. And um, I stopped taking that, which was saving us a bunch of money. To go along with the psoriasis, uh, I also started getting pain in the joints. And um, there was a big ice storm that hit Texas in 2014. And I had slipped on the deck and broke my... Uh, tore up the inner and outer meniscus of my knee. And when I went to have surgery, you know, they took x-rays of it and they said, oh, it looks like you've, with your psoriasis, you have psoriatic arthritis as well. So there's two autoimmune diseases that, um, that I'm, that are, you know, attacking my body simultaneously. And, um, which will, along with that came a lot of inflation, you know, in, inflammation in, in the joints, I've got, um, I broke my wrist last year and they saw uh, arthritis in the thumb joint, uh, that sort of thing. One of the oddest things I think that has happened to me was my ankles had swelled up and I don't have a timeline on this. I tried finding uh, when this happened, but my ankles swelled up. They look like grapefruit and I couldn't even get my shoes tied. And I went to doctor for that and they did ultrasounds on the inner and the inner thigh. Uh, looking down at the big main vein that goes down through there. And they said, I was diagnosed with what's called venal reflux. So, you know, when, when the blood pulses in the veins, you know, they, the valves open and they shut and they open and they shut. Well, mine was just fluttering. So the blood would get down to my feet, but there was no way to get it to come back up because there was no way to build pressure in there to get it to pump back the way it was supposed to. So I had a procedure where they went down the inside of the thighs and they cauterized veins um, that were that were causing that had this problem, which caused other veins that were in good shape to take over the blood flow and the, the swelling um, the, that swelling had gone away. Uh, the year after I got the uh, CPAP machine, uh, I decided a, I thought it was very smart to become a truck driver. I'm already in a sedentary job as a mechanical designer, but for some reason I had a calling to become a truck driver. And uh, when you're driving a truck uh, here in the United States, you drive as far as you can in 11 hours or in 14 hours, whichever it is, whatever you're allowed to work. Uh, but you drive as far as you can. If that left door is open, you're not making any money and neither is the company you're working for. And uh, in 2017, I had, Three months into truck driving, I'd had enough, and I came off the road, and two weeks later, I started having pain in the backs of my calves and ended up with a very severe case of uh, pulmonary embolisms, blood clots in my lungs. And they said, based on the pain in your thigh or in your back of your calves, and, and, and they did another ultrasound, they did not see any blood clotting in my legs, but they said my lungs... Um, my lungs were in really bad shape with blood clots. And, um, you know, when, when I got out of the hospital, I was in the hospital for four days for treatment, getting on blood thinners. Uh, when I came home from the hospital and I was Googling some images of what, what does a blood clot look like in the lung, you know, and, and they look like slugs. And I get to realize that the pictures that they were showing were all autopsy photos. And... I think I realized then just how close I came. They said they hadn't seen that many blood clots in one lung and someone would still be breathing. And, uh, you know, I was on oxygen for a while and I was on blood thinners for years um, uh, and then decided to, you know, to come off of them. But the blood clotting thing, that was one of those uh, issues back when where you like, wow, I got a second chance, right? So... My highest weight, uh, like I said, I sent you a picture of that was 335 pounds in 2013. And I did, over time, bring my weight down all of 20 pounds by the time that uh, 2019 came around, about the time of the pandemic. And I realized that I needed to do something. And um, like, like somebody heard the calling 
a, a shop opened up one mile from my house called, uh, and I don't know if you'll allow names, we'll just call it TTT. Uh, the business doesn't exist anymore. Um, Total Transformation. Okay. Names are okay. Okay. Total Transformation Training was the name of it. And it was a weight loss boot camp, one-on-one -on -one with, a, with a physical trainer. And uh, this lady had extensive history. I did an interview with her and uh, ultimately ended up going with, in with her. I was weighing 315 when I went into Total Transformation Training. And like I say, they're just a mile from the house. And uh, I worked with her for a couple of years and I get down to about 285. And she put me on a couple of diets that uh, they were starvation diets. Uh, you, you just come all the way out and all you would eat is like maybe some tuna fish wrapped in a, a piece of lettuce, you know, starting out. And you would start to add stuff back in. And she had this whole recipe book of, of items that you could fix if you went by the plan. And it was a one month plan and I would lose 35 pounds on it. But then, boom, I just gained the weight, uh, gained the weight right back. So I was with her up until about 2021 and she decided to scuttle the business and turn it into a uh, bistro, I think is what she called it, uh, fancy coffees and sandwiches and what have you. But before she did that, she did hire on a man who would change my life forever. Uh, I'll call him Jules because he's high energy and he and I measure him by the Jules, you know, the measurement of energy. And um, we worked with him for a bit. And when she scuttled the business, he went to another place. Um, uh, Q Fit is the name of them. And he went to work there and he said, you guys need to come up here. You'll really like this place. And so we stuck with him and he got me into really good physical shape. But again, my weight, it, it'd get down to that 285 and it would just hover in the 285 range. I was putting on muscle. I was feeling fantastic. I was breathing good because we were doing cardio and upper body and lower body and all this good stuff. And uh, I had decided to um, talk with his boss. His boss was a certified dietitian. And I talked with his boss and they he worked out on, on a napkin and some algorithms and you know calculator and he worked up how much uh, protein I should be getting and how much, uh, how many calories I should be intaking on my diet. And that was in July of 2023. I had had all the other elements in place, building muscle, working out. My stamina was really high, but my diet was the, was the key factor that was holding me back on losing weight. So in August of 2023, frustrated that even his diet plan wasn't really working was when I decided to put myself on a low carbohydrate diet. Because when I look back in the history, the one diet that has not, that probably did the best for me was the Atkins diet. And I had lost 50 pounds on the Atkins. But the problem was it never got rid of the cravings. So I still crave potato chips and popcorn. And so once you start once that crosses your lips it just more and more come before you know it boom you know you've you lost 50 but you gained back 60. um so this time i said well i'm not going to do atkins because i don't like the store with all the pro processed atkins stuff and and the keto friendly i said no we're, we're going low carb that's what i'm calling it i know what it takes to go low carb but this time around I'm not going to cheat myself and start letting those other uh, items sneak back in. And then, of course, uh, as we started this out, two weeks later, after cooking up this parcel of, of meat, I accidentally, on purpose, uh, found carnivore. So, um, I, because I've already been on a low-carb diet, I kind of slid in and didn't feel the keto flu. I didn't experience the keto flu. In fact, as soon as I went carnivore, my uh, energy levels spiked. And uh, one of the things that Laura Spath had on her video of what I eat in seven days on the carnivore diet is she did a breakfast of four eggs with bacon and cheese. And I'm like, I've never eaten four eggs before. How, how do you, how does a lady like her stuff four eggs in her, in her stomach? How do you just do that? And so I had worked out, um, did a really good workout with, with Jules 
And I came home and I said, I'm going to do that. So I cracked open four eggs and I made it just like she made it. And I sat there in the last bite for me, a big guy who likes to eat. I was having trouble stuffing that last bite down. But that was probably one of the best days I've ever had on the carnivore diet. It was just so much energy from the workout. And then that breakfast was just, wow. It just, I was amazed at the energy levels that had, that had happened. And it's like the whole, my, I could look at my work and my work just like, it's like the fog had cleared and I could see my work. And it's not, probably not just from this one meal because I'd been on carnivore for a couple of weeks already. Um, I had lost 36 pounds. Uh, okay, initially the four pounds from uh, the low carb and then an additional 32 pounds up into the, uh, the October time frame. My, the inflammation in my joints was noticeably better. The pain in, in you know, the dexterity in the thumbs, the knees, I could go up and down steps. There was no pain. Uh, so I feel for you when, when you did the, uh, when you stood at the top of the steps and you jumped down, you know, your knee pain, I, I, could, I could understand, I could understand the joys of that again, to be able to walk up the steps and not have to do one step at a time and walk down the steps. It's just, it became normal again. Um, psoriasis was going away. That was, that was going away very quickly. And normally my, my psoriasis is like a tide. Uh, it comes in around Christmas time, gets really, and you wouldn't think it would get high in the summertime because suppose you could get in the sun and the sun would, would burn the psoriasis away, but it didn't for me. And then uh, come around the fall when you're putting your clothes back on because the temperatures are changing, it would start going away. And by Thanksgiving, it would be gone. But just around Christmas time, you'd be like, boop, boop, boop. All these little spots would start to show back up. And it would, the cycle would, in 20 years of this kind of a cycle. And uh, so this stuff started going away. And it's like, okay, we'll watch it because this is about the time my psoriasis would go away. Anyways, it's just going away a little faster. And my psoriatic arthritis was definitely not in pain anymore. And the swelling had gone away. So we may have, we may have hit the uh, golden goose here. So uh, about mid-October, I began to realize I'm no good at cooking steak. And I'm no good at cooking chicken. Or in this case, I'm no good at cooking grainy meats uh, because I was having trouble uh, swallowing. And uh, it got progressively worse. And I told my wife, I said, I think I cook steaks and chicken just fine. I said, I think, I think there's something else going on. And um, my doctor uh, got me a, um, uh, a, a referral. Sorry, we, we can cut that out. My doctor got me a referral to a GI doctor and... Uh, it was time for the cameras to meet in the middle, the colonoscopy and the endoscopy. Yeah, because it had been 11 years since the last time it was checked. And uh, and he had told me at the time, he says, yeah, he says, it's your age. The there's a, uh, a ring in the, the esophagus that will shrink. And what we'll do is we'll just go in there with a balloon. And we'll inflate that thing and we'll dilate it back out. And you'll be good to go for a few years. And then you'll have to come back and have it done again. I'm like, great, I'm making more doctor friends here. So we, uh, we went in and had the, uh, the, the endoscopy and the colonoscopy done. And she came in and she says, your colonoscopy is fine. We, we removed a couple of polyps, whatever. I'm like, Ugh. but she says, um, she says, I'm, I'm sorry to tell you. She says, you have a seven centimeter tumor in your esophagus and your esophagus is pretty well cancerous and she told me it was a very aggressive cancer and so if you've ever seen those um uh those old commercials where the guy's sitting back in the chair and the music about to blow through him you know and he's just sitting there taking it well that that's the way i was the c word just blew through me and i just sat there and i looked at her and i realized her her gaze was this very solemn, she just gave me some really horrible news. And I went like, oh, she's waiting for a response from me. So I said the F word. I went, F? 
And she's like, I'm, I'm sorry. She says, I'm sorry to tell you this. And I said, well, don't tell me anymore until my wife comes in and we can explain it to her. So um, I came home and I said, I got to stay calm about this. You know, it was inevitable that, you know, everybody gets cancer nowadays. So it was just my turn kind of thing. And I came home and I told my kids and I told my mother, which, you know, when you tell your mom, you don't have to tell anybody else because she broadcasts out to everybody, but uh, not to my dad. So I called my dad up and I talked to him and he says, tell me exactly what she said. And I said, well, she said it's a very aggressive cancer and it's a seven centimeter tumor. And I said, that's roughly, I think, two and a half inches. So that's, that's pretty good. It's a, that's pretty good size. And, uh, and he says, well, there is your key word. He says, aggressive. If your cancer is aggressive, you have to be more aggressive. So he said, open up Google. And he says, who do you want to treat your cancer? He says, do you want to treat local? Do you trust anybody local or do you want the best? And I said, well, I said, if my insurance paid for it, I want the best. And, um, uh, I'm going to make this real short. We, um, there was two of them, one in New York City. They were number two in the nation. And one in Houston, Texas, they were number one. Am I allowed to say their name? The MD Anderson in Houston, Texas. And um, so I, said, I told him, I said, if my insurance would pay for it, I said, I'd love to do uh, MD Anderson to do my treatment. So the, that was on a Wednesday when I told my dad, and the next day I went to see Jules for a workout, and I explained to him what was going on. I said, things are about to get pretty pretty, uh, pretty interesting here over the next couple of months. I said, you need to sharpen your pencil and, and, and uh, open up your Google Foo and find out what kind of exercises you can do to help me through my cancer treatment. I said, otherwise, I'm sticking with my carnivore diet. I didn't tell him it was carnivore. I just told him I'm sticking with my diet because he was like, in the fact, shoot, I'd lost 30 something pounds, you know, by the time I got this diagnosis. And then um, I came back from exercising with Jules and I walk in and my wife says, do you want to go to MD Anderson? I said, well, of course I do. And she says, I just talked with the insurance. They will cover everything. And then she went to work out with Jules because it's a family thing. The whole family works out with this gentleman. He's fantastic. Um, so she went to work with him. So I got online to MD Anderson and I, and I did, I filled out the new patient form. And before the evening was out, I had a surgical oncologist and within a week I had to be at MD Anderson. Now the ending to the whole diagnosis of my story is early November. They did a PET scan on me where they, they get this, uh, nu uh, nuclear, uh, uh, contrast that they put in your body you have to stay very calm uh, because it looks for a metabolism so it's going to see your brain brain has a metabolism it's going to see your bladder and your kidneys because it's trying to get the contrast out of your system they'll they'll glow is what they'll do and so they showed me the pictures of the cancer because the cancer has its own metabolism that's why your body doesn't attack it to get rid of it it actually builds blood vessels to support it it had its own metabolism and he says, you have stage three cancer. And I said, okay, stage three is pretty bad. And he says, it is. He says, but the only reason it's stage three is because the tumor has metastasized to at least one lymph node. And then he gave me what we were going to do for treatment. So I'm going to skip ahead in my story here because it's cancer treatment, right? So I started my cancer treatment at the end of November and it was a trifecta. So the first two were given simultaneously. It was chemotherapy, hence the hair, and it was what they call proton therapy. So when they do radiation, they don't radiate the whole body. They actually made a mold of uh, my esophagus through the uh, PET scan, and they created these what I call lenses. So they shoot the radiation through the lenses and the lenses are able to go to the exact spot where the cancer is. And they just, they just nuke, they just nuke <laughs> uh, Lincoln here. Um, so I did those two simultaneously. It was six weeks of treatment. It was from the end of November to the beginning of January. 
Now, here's where my story skips ahead. Everything was fine. I was like, wow, I'm actually doing chemo pretty good. And, you know, radiation, it's starting to burn a little bit here, but I'm handling it. I'm eating my carnivore. You know, I've got my bacon, my eggs. Uh, the the uh, cafeteria there in the hospital has grilled chicken and grilled hamburgers. It's like I'm doing really good and I'm sticking to my diet. Three and a half weeks into treatment, I lost all my taste buds. The, the whatever flavor eggs turned into repulsed me. The smell of bacon repulsed me. I couldn't taste the hamburgers. I couldn't taste anything. And at that, and then the week later, my psoriasis came back. And I got one year's growth of psoriasis in one week. And I did not send you the pictures. They are, they are rather disturbing. And, and I showed them to the, the chemo, chemo guy. I said, you don't understand. I said, I just got rid of all my psoriasis. And I said, now I've got one year's worth of growth here in a week. So the uh, other thing that started coming on at the same time, it, because food, I had no flavor for food anymore, I stopped eating. And the proton guy, he tells me, he says, if you don't start eating, he says, we're going to have to hold off any more treatment for a week. And I'm going to have to build a new mold because if you lose more than 10 pounds, your esophagus is going to change location because fat will be going away and it'll change location. And we'll have to cut new lenses to shoot in a different spot. And he says, you need, he says, we're going to, we're going to, you need to contact your dietitian. And the dietitian, of course, well, you need to get carbs and you need to get calories and you need to find something that you can eat. And Chick-fil-A to the rescue, the only thing that I could taste with any certainty was a Chick-fil-A spicy chicken sandwich. And the bread was for the calories and the carbs they wanted. And of course, the chicken was for the flavor and the protein because my hair had started to really start falling out by then. And uh, that wasn't enough. So my wife's like, well, we need to go get you milkshakes. And I said, I don't want a milkshake. Uh, but I said, I would like some chocolate chip mint ice cream. So now I'm starting to backpedal. I can't do the carnivore because I couldn't taste it. I would end it. I mean, I just, it was easier to push it away than it was to try to, to consume this. So anyways, um, treatment was done in early January. I passed with flying colors. They did a PET scan. And uh, the only thing they saw was the irradiated um, from the proton therapy. The esophagus was extremely angry. And so, uh, so they sent me home for eight weeks to recover. In that eight weeks, I swapped over to a uh, surgical dietitian. Her job was to keep my weight up for surgery because the surgery was going to lose enough weight by itself because I wouldn't be eating for like four days after the surgery. And uh, so she needed to keep me healthy. She says, you need to find something you can eat when you're at home during this recovery phase. And still could not taste anything. And anything that was too spicy, even though I couldn't taste it, it would set fire to my esophagus because my esophagus, as my proton therapist explained, it's like we sunburned your esophagus and it's, it's extremely severe and it will be hurting for a while. So I was eating soups. I was back to eating, you know, processed soups that said, you know, made with uh, bioengineered ingredients because it wouldn't hurt going down. And I, it was the only way I could keep my weight up. So I started to get my strength back. Um, my hair stopped falling out a little bit. Uh, of course, all my psoriasis had gone away. I had even gotten, it's, and, uh, yeah, you can see there's a few dots here. And that is left over from a syndrome caused by uh, chemotherapy called sweet syndrome. I broke out in these knots all across my arms into my fingertips. I still got some remnants in the fingertips, but it was just from the elbows to the fingertips on both arms. And uh, that's taking months for that to go away. There was, there was really uh, no treatment for that. So anyways, we're going to skip ahead to March. March is, is key in my journey because I'm on a carnivore diet and or had started a carnivore diet and I need to get back to it and I can't till certain parts of the journey is over with. So for the, esoph the esoph esophageal cancer treatment, 
the trifecta was the chemo and the radiation together. And then the third was going to be surgery. And so I went back to Houston. They did another PET scan and they showed me the pictures and my esophagus was wide open again. The cancer was dead completely. And head to toe, they saw no distance metastasis. There was no other indication that the cancer was around. And they, this was a key point in, in my treatment. They gave me the option. They said, you can opt not to have surgery and you can go back uh, to your lifestyle. And when the pain from the radiation goes away, you can eat like a normal human being. However, your, your um, mortality rate is higher chance of you getting cancer back. So you will have, for the next five years, you'll have to come back every six months for a PET scan to make sure that no other cancer has uh, started back up. I said, okay. And I said, what's the other? And he says, if we cut out the damaged portion of your esophagus, uh, he says, you have an 80% chance of not getting cancer. And it's like, uh, take it. Uh, take it. It's yours. I said, I, I don't see the other option. I would be looking over my shoulder for the rest of my life with cancer. Just knowing cancer is chasing me down a dark alley, right? So on uh, March 15th, I went in. My family was there. And uh, I had a, a complete esophagectomy, which was three surgeries in four and a half hours. Um, they rolled me on my left side and they used a robot to go into my right side. And the robot had cameras. It was kind of like um, when they take your, I can't think of the surgery, they, what they call it, um, where they just do the, the minor stuff and they pull everything out through your belly button between the ribs with a cutter, camera, and I don't know what else. And they cut my esophagus uh, up in here, uh, put a chest tube in, closed me up with glue. <laughs> that was kind of interesting. Rolled me on my back, uh, right below my belly button, cut an upside down smiley face. And they went in and they took my stomach. Basically, they sleeved the stomach. They turned it into a tube and cut out large portion of the stomach and pushed it up into, um, and pushed it, well, they hadn't pushed it up yet. They did that. Then they put in what they call a J-tube, which is a feeding tube that goes straight into the first part of the lower intestine. They closed that up. The third surgery is they, they went into my neck. They took my esophagus and my stomach and they pulled it out. They cut off the damage. And the uh, hiatal hernia that I had 35 years prior, the guy said was a perfect specimen to sew it to what is left of my esophagus, which is not very much. And then they push it all back in. So essentially from here to just, just right at my sternum is my stomach. So my stomach is no longer, you know, I can't reach down here. So, oh, I got a stomach ache. It's like, no, that's your abdomen. Officially your stomach is, is up here now. Um, so I am going to go back on a little something. The hiatal hernia brought on, bad heartburn. Bad heartburn turned into severe uh, acid reflux. Acid reflux turned into GERD. GERD turned into Barrett's esophagus. Barrett's esophagus is aggravated esophagus. It turned into a tumor in cancer. And it's, it's one of those 35 years ago, had they said, oh yeah, you've got a, uh, a hiatal hernia and then said, here's how we're going to fix it. That would have been great. They didn't fix it then. And so here I am today. Um, now, after surgery, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna go back up. We're going to move forward from here because I'm reaching the end of my story, which is very... I could not wait to get back to carnivore. My taste buds were back in action. So I was eating carnivore. At the same time, I'm on this feeding tube. Now, and I've got the list here of the ingredients. 
when I was in the hospital and they first put the feeding bag on, it's going to give me the nutrition into my feeding tube. It's like, wow, I can't wait to see what they're going to pump me back to health with. And the first five ingredients of this stuff is water, corn syrup, maltodextrin, canola oil, and soy protein isolate. And I looked at my sister. Healthy. And my started to get hoarse. Huh? I looked at my sister and I said, you got to be kidding me. I said, these are like the worst ingredients. I said, this is the stuff that fuels cancer. You know, cancer loves sugar and I am going to starve this cancer. So that gave me motivation to do what I needed to do to get off of this stuff. And um, I was on six of these cartons that gave me, you know, I was on a no carbohydrate diet. And now I'm on a feeding tube that is feeding almost 300 carbs into me every day. Um, 375 calories per carton, which I don't mind the calorie. And I think it was 22 grams of protein. And I didn't mind the protein. But the ingredients list was like the preface to war and peace. I could not believe the junk that was in this thing. So one of the gifts they gave me when I left the hospital was, hey, you can take one of the cartons away and you only have to do five when you get home. It's like, sweet. And so I got home, we got set up with home health, you know, and, and I got my little pole with my little pump. And uh, a week later, I could knock it down to three. And I said, yeah. And so each time we knocked it down, I had to find something to supplement the loss of that nutrient. I had to find something good. And, um, uh, she says, you can't do carnivore right now because carnivore is a weight loss. Um, it, it is a weight loss type of diet. You know, it's, it's almost zero carb, that kind of thing. I'm like, right. She says, no, that's bad. <laughs> so the treatment with the cancer, you know, I lost the, the initial 36 pounds up to the end of October, but with the treatment of cancer up to... Um, when they finally took off my last carton of formula, uh, I had lost not fat, but all muscle tone. I, uh, I look at myself in the mirror and it almost brings me to tears that I've got bones sticking through my shirt and skin just hanging on me where muscle used to be. And I, you know, I, I showed, showed my stomach and I showed my ribs to Jules, you know, my trainer. And he says, all right, I know what I need to do. He says, we need to get muscle put back on you immediately. And uh, you know, he can't give me diet advice because he's not a, a certified dietitian. But he does kind of throw some shade my way about you know, what I should be eating, you know, keeping my carbs up. He says, I don't care if you eat ice cream. Whatever you do, let's keep that weight up so that they can officially say the um, feeding tube can come out. And so uh, a week ago tomorrow, the feeding tube came out. It's like freedom. And I started on the carnivore diet the very next day, uh, which was Friday last week. From Friday <laughs> to this morning, I've lost seven pounds. And uh, I told my wife, I know yesterday, yesterday morning, I had lost seven pounds. And I told my wife, I said, that's even scaring me because am I losing muscle still or am I losing fat because I know I'm still overweight uh, my current weight uh, is 204 as of this morning so starting around 289 in August or if we want to say with the carnivore diet we'll say in September I started at 285 and I now weigh 204 I've lost a total of 41 pounds 36 pounds I can say came from the carnivore diet because from October up to October, I didn't have any trouble swallowing and I was enjoying every bite there was. The trouble swallowing came in afterwards. So that's kind of where I'm drawing the line in the sand where the chemo, the radiation, the cancer, the surgery, all of that started stripping uh, protein from my muscles, from my hair, um, from my nails. My nails are in really ugly shape. 
and it's stripping protein in order to my body went through some pretty horrendous damage you know as far as my body knows there was some big time damage going on in there and it's doing what it can to repair and so it's stripping the protein from my muscles and so i have to decide now today is this uh you know am i still losing protein and, and still re rebuilding stuff because i don't have any trouble swallowing i don't have any trouble um, you know, pushing food through the system. What I do have trouble with is because my stomach is, they say the content is smaller than my fist that I can take at any one time. So I have to eat every two hours. And I am finding that I'm having, and I'm, maybe I'll maybe I'll put this out as a as a call for help to your fan base, to your to your to your uh, subscribers that may have gone through something similar to this, that uh, I, even at eating five, six times a day, which is uh, extremely tough, um, especially on a carnivore diet. And I'm enjoying steak and I'm enjoying chicken again and I'm cooking hamburgers and I'm eating eggs. I just can't eat a lot of it. Whereas I used to eat, you know, a big old steak. Now steaks are literally triangles about that big is about all I can handle with a little bit of chicken. Uh, they're basically saying a cup of food, and it's like I got to do that every two hours and try to keep my calorie count up to like 375, and I'm really, uh, I'm really struggling with that. Um, and um, when I went back last Friday and started my carnivore diet over, keto flu hit me hard because I went cold turkey. The difference between my starting carnivore in September was is I was already two weeks into a low-carb diet. Um, and so when I went into a no-carb diet and started carnivore, I was just like, energy just spiked. And I was like, wow, I can't wait to get back to this, you know? And so I started the carnivore. I was so excited uh, last Friday to start carnivore. And I started feeling ill. You know, my body was trying to transition over to burning fat again and not carbs. And it's like, hey, you know, where's the carbs, yo? Um I get the shakes. Um, I did cure the shakes with uh, uh, electrolytes, Element, and I'm not doing a commercial for Element here, but I do uh, subscribe to the Element theory, and I put Element in some water, and um, these the shakes would go away. Um, the um, you know I've tried to take supplements. Um, but my esophagus now is so small that the pills don't don't make the transition and go down. I can take a little bitty D3 pill and I can take my dinky little blood pressure pill and I can take my um, antacid pill that I'll be on on the rest of my life. But uh, anything larger than that is may as well be a horse pill, as we call them, you know, when you can't swallow them, you know, and I've never had trouble swallowing, uh, swallowing pills and um uh, so I don't have any kind of supplement going in. The only supplement I get, you know, is is nutrient dense beef, which I can't eat a lot of. So I am I am struggling at this time to uh, get back to carnivore. I'm I'm wrestling right now, almost feeling like a failure because I'm I'm actually entertaining the idea of adding some carbs back in and maybe going to. And maybe it's not so much feeling of failure as, you know, ketovore is a thing. There, I've, I've heard the term ketovore, even though I don't like named diets. Ketovore out there is an option. Or just going back to a low carb, maybe introducing back 20, 30 carbs until we can, so that I can slow this weight loss. I'm not at my ideal weight, but I don't want to reach my ideal weight next week, you know. Uh, that's just, that's just too fast. And, um, I'm not sure what my ideal weight is. If you Google it, I'm supposed to weigh 161 pounds. If I weighed that much, I'd blow away in the wind. Uh, I've always felt best about 195 pounds. And right now I'm about five pounds away from that. And so, uh, I'm, I'm needing to slow it down. I don't mind a slow pace. Uh, but uh, it started coming off real fast, and it actually scared me. And so, I, like I say, I am questioning as to whether or not I'm lo losing fat or I'm losing muscle. Now, 
Um, my family was very impressed with the carnivore diet initially before I went in for surgery to the point my sister was trying it. My mother incorporated in cutting out more carbs and introducing more protein. Um, and my sister's husband, who has trouble with um, uh, diabetes, uh, probably pre-diabetic, um, he tried it to bring to see what his, his blood numbers were going to be like. Which I will, I'm going to, I'm going to finish up my story here. Uh, everybody likes to give blood work. Now, I was pre-diabetic before I started the carnivore diet. My blood was, uh, or my uh, A1C was 5.9. And just before surgery, they did a full blood workup on me just before surgery. Uh, my fasting glucose was like 84. And my A1C had dropped down to 4.7. So I was out of the, the pre-diabetic range. That may, it put a big, big smile on my face. Uh, the only other time my blood work had put a smile on my face was when I was still doing carnivore and was in early treatment. They did some blood work on me, and they noted in there that I had unusually high ketones. <laughs> and I thought, yeah. <laughs> um, so that's, that's uh, Dave, that is, that is my story. Um, just wow. right when I get into it, I get this this diagnosis. Now I get another chance at life, uh, cancer free. Uh, I will still have to go back for PET scans to make sure that you know there's no distance metastasis or anything like that. And I have full intent on staying with carnivore uh, simply because the autoimmune. You know, this, the, uh, the, I've got one little spot right there. He just don't want to go away, but he's going away um, to get rid of my psoriasis. Uh, not having to take an aspirin or an ibuprofen for, you know, joint pain so that I can, you know, I can run my little mouse when I do my CAD job or uh, walking up and down stairs or walking up and down the road here with my wife. You know, we, we do some walks in the evening time as long as it's not sweltering heat. And, uh, those things are, are very important to me because my weights, it's getting better. So I, I need to, I think with staying on the carnivore diet will help me uh, keep the weight maintained, but it will also keep my uh, autoimmune diseases at bay. So, um, well, firstly, congratulations on where you've got, I mean, you've got very far over, over the last, I mean, of course, through this can the cancer and stuff but just the the whole journey's been been an epic one so mm -hmm. congratulations on getting through it thank you um and it's good to hear that you know things like the arthritis and and so forth uh, have gone um what is I, I think the most important thing actually to talk about here is um you mentioned that you know you were hoping to perhaps get some feedback from people within the community. Like what, what is your, what is your message or what kind of questions would you like to pose to the community? I guess, uh, how on a carnivore diet with the stomach, the size of my fist, you know, a cup of food, uh, six times a day, am I going to be able to get enough calories and protein in that um, that I can maintain a healthy presence? Uh, stop the uh, my body from stripping uh, the protein from the muscles. To, I need to build my muscles back. At the same time, I need to keep the fat away. I just I'm you know the doctor said don't get in a hurry. It could take a year before you're back to eating normally. and uh, But in the meantime, don't lose weight. <laughs> and, uh, um, I'm struggling with the carnivore diet, fearing that I'm not getting enough in because I really don't need uh, to revert back to um, being a, a skinny, you know, too skinny, too frail uh, person all, all, all in the name of, of staying on the carnivore diet. I know there's a way out there. There may be a food that I haven't introduced yet 
uh, maybe I should eat steak six times a day, you know, every two hours, chomp down a, a piece of a sirloin, cut a big sirloin up into six pieces, you know, and eat on that all day. Um, but at the same time, you know, like, like the Sean Bakers and the, uh, Anthony and Anthony Chafee and, um, you know, uh, they, you know, they can sit there and eat those great big thick ones in a sitting, you know, the big chunks. And I just watch those videos and I'm like, if I hadn't had the surgery, could I still eat like that? Or, you know, am I going to eat my steak while, you know, the, the can the dark cancer is chasing me down the road. I need to understand that uh, staying the course with carnivore here is the right thing to do. Um, I'm, I'm, I've been trying some different things, uh, adding in an extra meal. That, that's, that's something else I got to, I got to kind of explain the, the problem of why this is the way it is, is when they cut into the stomach, I got a feeling there's some nerve endings that haven't woke back up or hopefully they're not gone forever because you would know when you're hungry because your stomach would growl and gurgle and all that. Mine doesn't. The only way I know that I'm hungry is I'll feel peckish. Like, whew, it might be time to something to eat because my stomach, it feels full all the time. There's just, there's no, uh, and of course, if you overfill it, it, it will it will let you know that you've overfilled uh, because there's no sphincter muscle, you know. So it's just like, oh, too much, you know. It's, but there's nothing in there that tells me when I'm hungry. I have to clock watch, you know, every two hours I have to eat. And I think the metabolism has slowed down enough that I'm not processing the food through fast enough. Um, because every two hours, I, I just, you know, you just eat a little bit, just eat a little bit. And it's like, but if I eat a little bit, how can I get the nutrient dense foods? Of course, my mom's idea was um, eat avocados. Avocados are extremely nutrient dense. She says, I know against your, it goes against your eating vegetables and fruits. And I think avocado is actually listed as a fruit. But it's very nutrient dense. She says, mash it up and put it in your tuna fish as a replacement for a mayonnaise or something. And she says it actually works really good that way. Now, I just couldn't bring myself to eat green tuna fish, but that's, uh, you know, that's, that's, that's up here. <laughs> you know, green foods, that, that's, that's up here. Um, so, you know, the, the community, if, if they've been through something like this, uh, you know, I know that um, like gastric bypass patients, I talked with one lady today who had a gastric sleeve done and she struggled for a year because she lost muscle and fat at the same time when, and she lost her hundred pounds and it took a year. Her stomach did stretch back out a little bit. So she says, you've got that to look forward to your stomach may stay as a tube going up between your lungs. But we'll tend to open at the bottom. You, know, you get so much food in there, it will start to expand again so that you, you can hold more. So maybe that's what the doctor means, that in a year I'll be eating normally again. And what I'm not showing is patience. I am two months out of surgery, and you know I'm wanting to eat as much carnivore as I can in order to to maintain a <clears throat> Sorry, I'm starting to lose my voice again. Starting to maintain a weight. And uh, so maybe patience is probably the biggest answer I just gave myself. You know, I've, I've got to remember to be be patient, and I'm not a patient man uh, in a lot of a lot of aspects. Johnny, well, hopefully we'll get some feedback from the community. Um, if people want to reach out to you directly rather than commenting about things, what's the best way for them to get in touch? I, I am on uh, Facebook at Johnny Paul. I have two YouTube channels that uh, they're on. They're kind of one of those that's in my bucket list that I'm going to get back to making videos on. And one is Dragonworks Rocketry. And I can't remember the other channel. One's a, one's a firearm channel. And I don't usually go to the firearm channel. I'm more of a, of a rocket guy. And I do uh, hobby rockets. And I can be reached there. And that's, that is through my uh, uh, YouTube channel. It's Dragonworks Rocketry. And it'll have a picture of, uh, I don't know, fire and a dragon and you know mm. sure so i'll, I'll pop, pop a link to those in the description 
And um, Johnny, thank you so much for coming on and sharing your story with us. I really appreciate your time. Oh yes, and and thank you for for carving out a, out a time to allow me to uh, tell my journey. I sure do appreciate everything you do for us.